I'm Matt Rhodes. I work for Central Connecticut State University Veterans History Project, and I am here interviewing Michael Davis at Norwalk Community College, and it is the 11th of May, 2018. All right, and so, um, Mike, if you can state your name for the record. Michael Davis. All right, and so, um, in which war did you serve? I was in the service during the Vietnam War. Okay, and which branch of the service? Army. Great. All right. Corps. right. Oh, very good. Okay. So, um, so um, where'd you go to school? I went to Bucknell University after graduating from Maranek High School down in New York. Okay. And I think you mentioned you were in ROTC. Yes. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, even though I, I graduated high school in 1960, went to Bucknell in September of 1960, and the war in Vietnam did not start and really officially until 1961. Mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, um, I applied for ROTC it, it, so I wouldn't get drafted mm -hmm. uh, as a private. And um, uh, I was in ROTC mm -hmm. and therefore when I graduated Bucknell, I got commissioned as second lieutenant in the Army. Okay. So what was ROTC like? Uh, it was one of those basket weaving courses, if I may say so. Okay. I mean, as they say in college, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we learned some military history. Mm -hmm. uh, we we um, certainly did do some drilling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember how many hours a week, but it wasn't very time consuming. Okay, very good. And so uh, once you graduated, um, you were commissioned. And so, um, where, what was your first uh, posting? Uh, my first posting uh, was down to Fort Gordon, Georgia, where yeah. I had to go to the Signal Corps mm -hmm. school for Signal Corps officers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember exactly how long I was there. I think I was there for two to three months because okay. I know I got my first official mm -hmm. post uh, was up in New Jersey in September. Okay. And so, what, what kinds of uh, things did you learn when you were at Signal Corps officer school? Again, they, there was there was drilling, um, there was uh, military history that they taught you. Uh, I was I w don't remember clearly what information okay. was uh, disseminated to me about the Signal Corps uh, because, as uh, you may or may not know, uh, the Signal Corps used to be stringing telephone lines, sure. cables, mm -hmm. uh, and wire. Uh, mm -hmm. So, okay. So, what was your next posting? Uh, then I was uh, assigned to the 19th. Art my first official posting was to the 19th Artillery Brigade, mm -hmm. which was headquartered Fort Hancock, New Jersey. But I was actually on a post called Highlands Air Force Base, which was an Air Force uh, belt uh, base, mm -hmm. uh, about one and a half square miles on the top of a hill in Highlands, New Jersey. Okay. Um, no helicopter could even land on the top of that hill. So I don't know why it was an Air Force base, but it was an Air Force base, and there was an Air Force captain mm -hmm. who was the base commander, and the guards for the base were Air Force personnel. Okay. But uh, my unit, the 19th Artillery Brigade, which was headquartered at Fort Hancock, New Jersey, down on Sandy Hook okay. in New Jersey, uh, had about 30 or 50 uh, personnel mm -hmm. up on the hill handling uh, the business there, which we can discuss if you want. Sure. Well, what, what did you do there? Well, the, the 19th Artillery Brigade and the, the headquarters of it uh, at the top of the Highlands Air Force Base was responsible for uh, the New York Philadelphia Air Defense Command for the Nike missiles, mm -hmm. which were protecting uh, the U.S. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia and New York was our area of responsibility. There were Nike missiles up in, around Boston, obviously down in Washington, and I'm sure other places in the country. Um, and and it was a it was a primarily a radar installation, radar towers that were scattered in the area around New York between Philadelphia and New York, mm -hmm. um, were controlled out of this headquarters at the top of the hill. Okay. So, okay. And I was a, I was it was an artillery unit. I was a signal corps officer, and I was the S-5 mm -hmm. reporting to the brigade commander, who was a full colonel. 
Is the is the S five uh, uh, communications? Yes, sir. Okay, it's the communications. Okay, because I did you ever have any instances of of uh, Soviet subs prowling around off the coast and uh, kind of ar ar arousing your attention? I'm sure that in fact I know there were Soviet subs prowling the coast, yeah. but that wasn't what got our attention. Yeah, our attention was get, was gotten by the Russian bear bombers. Oh, okay. That would fly up and down the coast. Okay. Because again, this was this was Nike missiles, mm -hmm. which were ground air missiles. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure they. I don't know if they could or couldn't strike a submarine underwater. I, I would doubt it. Yeah. But they were ground air missiles. Okay. Um, for um, uh, protecting against aircraft. Okay. Okay. And so, um, so what was life on post like? Life on post was actually pretty common mm -hmm. and routine. I basically was working a nine to five job, mm -hmm. um, Monday to Friday. I, I have weekends off and evenings off. Um, I'd spend a lot of time at the beach in the summer, uh, the area off the Jersey coast there. Oh. Um, it was broken up. I mean, I had a lot of different responsibilities, but the prime security responsibility was being the crypto custodian of all this, the codes um, mm -hmm. uh, that existed. And all of the codes were work, the same thing that they talk about, the football right. that the president's military mm -hmm. attache carries right behind mm -hmm. him all the time. I mean, that was a part of the, mm -hmm. that's the top of the chain, and mm -hmm. I guess where I was, and it was in the middle. Uh, but anytime there was a code that was compromised someplace in the world, all of them had to change, mm -hmm. and we had like two or three hours uh, to get them in place, to get the new codes in place. So my phone would often ring at 2 a.m. in the morning at home, waking me up because I had to come in. There were, it required me and a master sergeant who was my master sergeant to have both of us to get access to codes to replace the codes, call in the units mm -hmm. from between New York and Philadelphia hmm. um, and to replace codes. So that was something that was out of the routine day to day. Okay. I mean, during the course of the day, um, again, I would be responsible just for being in the base and mm -hmm. making sure that everything was working communications-wise, the telephone system was working on the base. And Okay. Okay. Interestingly, I will tell you, uh, since you're up in this neck of the woods also, um, there is an observatory now up in Westport, mm -hmm. uh, which used to be the northern point of the New York Philadelphia Air Defense radar. Okay. There were, and I, when, when we had the, when we had the uh, full eclipse last summer, um, and in Westport they were letting people come and go look at the eclipse on the, on the, through the telescopes and, and the radar tower. I mean, the tower that's there, the observatory used to be one of our radar towers. Mm -hmm. There were actually two of them there. Mm -hmm. And that, while I was online, behind some gentleman who was probably a 50 to 60 year old guy, uh, he told an interesting story about how, he was a lifelong resident of Westport, of how when this installation was being built, the residents of Westport then fought tooth and nail not to have Nike missiles there because they didn't want them to be attacked. Mm -hmm. They didn't want, I mean, if anybody's gonna be attacked, and I laughed when he told the story because, and as a result of that, the actual missile silos, I think were, I'm not sure of this, so I may be wrong, mm -hmm. but I think they were up near um, uh, Trumbull, mm -hmm. or north of Trumbull, maybe Hamden, is where the missile batteries were. Interesting. This was only the radar towers. Mm -hmm. What he didn't understand is that, and what the people of Westport probably didn't understand then, was if the Russians were gonna attack us, the first thing they want to attack is the radar to cut our communications, not the missile silos. The missile silos were worthless if the radar couldn't communicate with them. Right. So I sort of I told him that story and he said, "Oh, <laughs> oh goodness." So, um, so how in the beginning did you avoid going to Vietnam? Um, I. Okay, in the big, well, how do I avoid in the beginning? I don't, I don't know in the beginning yeah. because, um, you know, when I got, when I graduated mm -hmm. and got commissioned, I went to Fort Gordon. My mm -hmm. first orders were to the 19th Artillery Brigade at Highlands. But um, by that time, we're talking about 
you know, we're talking about the end of 1964. We had more than observers just in Vietnam. I don't think we didn't have hundreds of thousands of troops yet, but, um, but uh, there was certainly a likelihood. All of the first lieutenant, all of the mm -hmm. second lieutenants who were the radar officers, mm -hmm. and it was 24-7, so mm -hmm. there were a lot of them there. All of them were rotating to Vietnam mm -hmm. literally on the 12th month and one day after they started their tour. And most of these guys were college graduates who had gone through ROTC. Mm -hmm. They were all second lieutenants. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, I was uh, sitting there uh, as I'm going along into my 10th month, ninth, 10th month of, of being on duty mm -hmm. and saying, I'm going to get orders one of these days, I'm going to get orders. And if you want me to go on with sure. the story of how I got go to right Vietnam, um, uh, I, about 10 months after I was there, the colonel, and he was a full bird colonel, uh, probably man was probably 55 years old, I was about 24, 25 then, obviously old enough to be my father, and my father actually had passed away, and he knew that uh, uh, about five years earlier. Um, and he called me into the office, and he said to me, son, do you like it here? And I said, yes, sir, of course I like it here. I go down to the beach, go home at five o'clock every day kind of thing. And he said, uh, would you like to stay here? And I said, of course I, I would, sir. And he, I said, but you know, I'm going to get orders just like every other second lieutenant mm -hmm. uh, to go to Vietnam. And he said, well, if you extend your, because I had a two-year uh, commission mm -hmm. responsibility, two years uh, as an ROTC officer, then you would go into the reserves. Mm -hmm. um, he said, if you, if, if you want to extend your active duty tour by a year, I can get you frozen in the spot. And I thought about it and said, uh, can I get back to you, sir? And I went home that week and talked to my mom, and who was scared to death that I would, would go to Vietnam, and my uncle, uh, who was a retired Marine Corps officer, um, and they both said, you know, after talking to each other, yeah, go, go do it. Well, a year to a, my mom then was probably 50 years old, my uncle was like 55 years old, and as I'm sure you and I appreciate now, a year mm -hmm. in our lifetimes now goes by like that. But mm -hmm. as a 24-year-old, a year is a long time. So, um, so uh, I, I was hesitant, mm -hmm. but um, I decided to do it. So I, I just went back the following weekend, uh, week, and I told the colonel I'd sign the papers, which I did. Should I continue on? Sure. Okay. So uh, now comes, oh, maybe 14 months of active duty, maybe even 15 months, I remember exactly. Um, and I'm in my office, and I get orders. And I open, I mean, a letter from DOD came, Department of Defense, and I open it up, and the first thing I see is Thompson Air Base, which is in Saigon. Mm -hmm. And I opened up and I looked, and I, I had a heart attack, and after I had my heart attack and got off the floor, I walked towards Colonel, and this was a barracks kind of building, and his office was the corner office, so we had two windows, whereas all the S1, 2, 3s, 4s, 5s, we all had one window. And I just walked down the hall, walked into his office. I didn't knock. I walked into his, to his office, and I said, Colonel, what the F is this? And I threw the orders on his paper. I didn't knock. I didn't salute. Totally unprofessional and unmilitaristic. And the, he he. He sat there and he, was, he had his glasses on, he was writing, and he slowly pushed back his chair and stood up and put his hands on his hips. And he says to me, and this man, by the way, was from Kentucky originally. Um, you know, I won't call him deep southern, but he was, had that twang and his southern kind of attitude, slow attitude. And um, he said to me, son, didn't they teach you how to read at that highfalutin college you graduated from? And I snapped to immediately and realized I was in trouble for being insubordinate at, at best. And um, um, he, uh, he said that to me and I said, yes, sir. He said, what's this mean? And he pointed to the letters TDY, which in military terms is temporary duty. And um, he said to me, um, I have my brother is who I think his brother was a two-star general in in Vietnam um, had had wanted to uh, get some help 
with, uh, he was talking to Brian about getting microwave systems set up around Tonson, or around Saigon, mm -hmm. but out of Tonson at Airbase. And uh, he said, I volunteered him to, I volunteered you to him for two weeks. So you're going to go there for two weeks, which turned out to be 21 days. Um, and uh, I never left Thompson at Air Base. I, I stayed on the base the whole time. Other guys were going downtown to Saigon. I stayed there on. And, and there, was some, there were some issues that even then. I mean, the, the Viet Cong, at night, they'd throw some mortars in mm -hmm. towards the base. Uh, you know, so mm -hmm. it wasn't a very safe place then. Right. So can you describe Tonson a little bit? Uh, interestingly, I went back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember it from when I was there, in all mm -hmm. honesty. But I went back, um, and that's the main airport now for Saigon. I went back, I went on a, as a vacation, as a tour. I went to Vietnam about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I, I, I saw the barrack where I, I mean, it's not a barrack now, but I saw the building where mm -hmm. I had slept there. And it was, it was, a, it was, an, it was an airfield. It, yeah. I mean, that's what it was. And it was an Air Force base, mm -hmm. Vietnamese, mm -hmm. South Vietnamese Air Force base. Mm -hmm. So it had barracks, and it's, it's totally different now, mm -hmm. but I saw the building that, that I was in. And so you were under mortar attack occasionally? Uh, yeah, I think I was, I think two, two or three nights, one or two rounds came, came in. To, and they didn't get close to the buildings, because, you know, it's a mile away. You know, an air, a runway is five, 6,000 right. feet long, right. so the, the perimeter was, was fairly secure. Who was responsible for, for uh, protecting the airport? South Vietnamese Air Army was. Well, okay. Was I always wondered about that. Yeah. yeah. We were, I, th I think we were still advisors right. then. I don't right. think that we... So this was still in 64 then? No, this was now in, this was now in mid to late 65. Okay. I, I had been in the service for about 15 or 18 okay. months. Actually, no. Actually, this might have been mid earlier to mid sixty six. Okay. Because it was I'd been in for two two years. I, ex I got the orders about a year after I extended. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you stayed there for three weeks, and um, didn't go into Saigon though. Never left. Yeah. From 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 Thompson Air Base to downtown Saigon is like going from LaGuardia Airport to Manhattan. Okay. It's like, it's not far in miles. It's maybe three or four miles. Right. But, uh, but uh, no, I never left. <laughs> what did the landscape look like? No, it was still, it was still, you know, this was very early still, yeah. 65, sure. very early in the war. Sure. Um, the Viet Cong had not, uh, and certainly none of the RVN, the, mm -hmm. the North Vietnamese tro troops had ever come not that far close. down. Right. Yeah, so this was, this was, this was, still, it, it, it was a Southeast Asian, which is, you know, uh, certainly not like the states. Uh, I mean, it was a tropical. It, it's tropical, yes, it is tropical, but it's but it's it wasn't very well developed. It was certainly a third world okay. country. Were you there during monsoon season? No, no. <laughs> That's no. good. No. Um, okay, so um, so you got so you, so you you're there for three weeks and you got to go back. Came home. Came back to New Jersey. Did you fly out of Tonson? Flew out of and then went, then went to the Philippines. Philippines to, I think, to Hawaii, and then Hawaii to California, California. New York. Okay. Took wow. four flights. Yeah. Now you can go there and overnight, right. nonstop. I mean, when, right. when I went, well, not not quite. I went from New York to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. nonstop over the pole. Mm -hmm. Then wow. Hong Kong is like going from Hong Kong to Hanoi, which is what my connection was uh, two to three years ago. It's like going from New York to Chicago. It's an okay. hour and a half flight. Okay. So you got back. Did you go back to uh, Fort Hancock? Well, I was Highlands well, Air Force Base, yeah. yes. Okay. Went right back there. I was, you know, he, Colonel actually expected me only to be gone for two weeks. And mm -hmm. I, I was there for 22 days, I think. Um, and got back and he said, he asked me, he said, did you have a nice time? I said, no, sir, but thank you for the question. <laughs> I was very polite to him after that. Okay, so how much longer were you in? Then I was in for about eight, seven or eight more months, mm -hmm. and then I got discharged. Okay. Did you have to spend time in the reserves? That was the one other thing, which I actually did not know when I, did, when I extended mm -hmm. my active duty tour for, for two years to three. I did not know that. It, it, 
in those days, you were on active duty for two years. I mean, I don't know what would have happened as the war progressed into the 70s mm -hmm. and stuff, but you were on duty for two years. You were in the active reserve, I think, for two years, and then the inactive reserve mm -hmm. for three or four years, I think, mm -hmm. was the routine. Mm -hmm. The one thing that happened as a result of being on active duty for three, four years is I went straight into the inactive reserve. So mm -hmm. that very next summer, that was, a, that was a benefit, if you will, for mm -hmm. a year of my life, mm -hmm. additional year of my life in, in, the, in the Army, uh, was I never went on active duty, uh, uh, when it never went into the active reserve, therefore I never had to go to summer camp that the guys always had to do. I didn't have to go to a monthly meetings for, you know, whenever they did that kind of thing. I never heard another word mm -hmm. after I got my DD, whatever it is, 202, 214. 214. Yeah. Yeah. Never heard another word from the Army. Very good. So what'd you do after? After the, got out after of the service? The, uh -huh. Then, well, as I said, I was a business major in college. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're a senior in college, um, at least back in the 60s, <coughs> um, regardless of what your major was, companies and entities would come on campus and interview kids. I don't mm -hmm. know if they do that now, but Some. <coughs> they did that then. And everybody interviewed. I mean, I interviewed a lot of companies, uh, like I can remember Sears Roebuck I interviewed. Um, uh, I interviewed several public accounting firms. Everybody else said, we're interested in you. Come see us when you get discharged. Mm -hmm. you know, we're interested in you, but come see us when you get discharged. Price Waterhouse, which is now known as Price Waterhouse Coopers, I think, um, actually gave me an offer and said, we will give, we offer you a job at the then current starting salary, because everybody got paid the same to start, mm -hmm. uh, when you get out of the service, which they thought was going to be September of 66, turned out to be in September of 67, mm -hmm. but they honored the, so I went into the Army knowing I had a job at Pricewaterhouse, which is really what I, I did want to go into the public county mm -hmm. to start, um, which gave me a lot of security, not worrying about, you know, sure. even back then, it's not as bad as it is now with jobs, but even back then, it was nice to, that? No, you had a job. Okay. I think. Sorry, I just heard a little. That was me. Oh, oh okay. Um, so I, when I got discharged, I went about two weeks after I got discharged, I think, I went down to 60 Broad Street and reported for duty there without a salute. Very good. Oh. Wearing a suit and tie. Very good. And a hat, because in those days you had to wear hats. Right, right. So if, I guess if you had, to, you know, just kind of reflecting on service in the Army, um, what did the Army really, uh, what kind of formative influence do you think the Army had on you? It, that's a good question, because it did have a formative influence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I certainly, I mean, I wasn't, I was pretty focused as a young, you know, as a late teen, early 20-year-old. Mm -hmm. I think I was pretty focused. I, I sort of knew what I wanted to do. My dad, as I said, had been killed in a plane crash mm -hmm. uh, when I was 19. I was a sophomore at Bucknell mm -hmm. when he was killed in a plane crash. Uh, and that certainly aged me a little bit. Um, and, um, uh, but it, it, it certainly gave me, it certainly amplified and, and gave me some of the focus that I had, some of the dedication I had, some of the strength to keep persevering that, that, mm -hmm. that I had in my life. Okay. So I know, because I know one of the, one of the interesting things about um, American society now is that I think the number is now um, about 1% of the population has actually served. 99% uh, haven't. So if there was, <laughs> so it, as, as one who served, is there anything that you would like to tell people about military service and and what it's like to be a veteran and well I certainly don't put myself anywhere near in the same criteria as any of what was called the greatest generation which is World War II vets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or even the Korean War vets mm -hmm. and even the Vietnam vets who really mm -hmm. were on the ground for a year mm -hmm. um, not not at all I mean I, I, I didn't know but there is no doubt in my mind that this country is the country it is mm -hmm. because of Americans, men and women, who have served in the military to not necessarily defend our country. Because first time we were ever, well, that's not true. First time we were attacked was 
December 7th, 1941. Then we went for another 70 years until, or 60 years, until 2001. Mm -hmm. But we've really never been attacked in this country. Hawaii mm -hmm. wasn't a part of the country. That was a possession. It right. wasn't even a part of the country. Uh, so we've never been attacked like most of the world has seen. Europe, certainly. Mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Japan. You know, when we end up mm -hmm. in Japan, we'd, they attacked us first. But we've never, we've never been in that position. Uh, but all of what we have is in part because we def defend. Now, I'm, I'm sitting here now, a 76-year-old man, and for several years, because I take a lot of courses at Lifetime Learners, um, and in many of the courses, I, I, I make the comment, I'm, t I'm personally tired of us being the policemen of the world. But, on the other hand, if we hadn't been the policemen of the world for the last 50 or 60 years, God knows what world we would be in right now. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, anybody that's served in the military, whether it be World War II in Europe or Japan, uh, Korea, Vietnam, Af uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, wherever, the, wherever troops have been and fought, and God bless them all. Anything you'd like to add? I'm not sure. No. I... Okay. Well, um... If there's nothing else you'd like to add, I, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I thank you very much. And thank you for your service and for talking with us. And, um, and thank, I, thank you, I thank you and, and Central Connecticut State for what you're doing to keep this. Okay. And I don't know if you know uh, uh, Karen Lyons, who does stuff at, at City Hall here in Norwalk to mm -hmm. honor vets and all the awards. Okay. So. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.